good to be in God's house, isn't it? And what an awesome presence of God we sense in this place this morning. Just know every time we worship him, and God finds our praises acceptable, he shows up and just does a work in our heart. Um, even before we've opened his word this morning, I know God has spoken into your hearts and into your lives. And aren't you glad for that this morning? That you sense him, that you know him, that he's here, that he wants to meet with you, that he wants to do something in you and for you before you leave here this morning. Great to be in God's house. Uh, Acts 2, some verses there. Thank you, Nicola. That day about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized and were signed up. I want hallelujah. Imagine 3,000 getting baptized. And let's pray that in the weeks and months that lie ahead, we some, see some more baptized in here at House of Worship in the name of the Lord. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. And every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. And we know God will bless his word to us this morning. I'd like to share for a little time this morning, if you'll let me on, where everybody is somebody. Where everybody is somebody. Now, for the observant, you'll know that that's the motto for this church here at House of Worship. House of Worship, where everybody is somebody. You know, I guess if I was to stand at the door of, of um, churches all across Northern Ireland this morning um, and ask the same question as I stood at the door of each of those churches, why are you here? Why are you here? I'm sure everyone who answers would give a slightly different answer of why they're here and would get many, many answers of what's happening. Some of them will be going out of tradition. Some will go out of fellowship with other people because they want to meet their family and friends. Others might go out of guilt. Some might answer, we will go here to worship God today and bless his name. Others might go just out of habit because that's what their families have always done. Some of them might not even know why they've showed up for church. They're just there for some reason or another. So today's message is really to remind ourselves why we do what we do. Why we are the church? What does the church mean to us? Why should we all get out of bed every Sunday morning and come to the Lord's house? What purpose do we do this for? And is it important to do this every week? Every week? Sometimes more than once every week, if we're so blessed to be able to do that. You know, actually, a few years ago, I bumped into somebody who I hadn't met for a, a, a quite a while, and I said to them, oh, how are you doing? I'll not mention their name. Um, and I said, uh, are you still going to that particular church? And I mentioned the name of the church. And they said to me, oh, no, I, I don't go to church anymore. And I thought, okay. I said, well, that, that's disappointing. I said, does it mean you're not serving the Lord anymore? Have you given up on your faith? Oh, no, they said, I'm still serving God. I still have a good relationship with God. I just don't need church anymore. I don't go to church. I just fellowship and worship with God in my own house. I listen to a good message off the God channel. And sure, that's wonderful. That's brilliant. Now, I can assure you, most of you knowing me will probably understand that the reply and response I gave to them was not exactly what they wanted to hear. Because church is important, and everybody in it is important. And the Word of God stresses that being in God's house with God's people, the family of God, is important. In fact, the Bible goes so far to say that God actually created the church to help His people fulfill the purpose that He has for our lives. And so this morning, we're going to review God's purposes for our life and see how the church helps us fulfill them. Who believes God has a purpose for you and a plan for you? Well, believe it or not, the very church family that you're sitting in today, and I remember, we're not talking about the building. We're not talking about being in a building. We're talking about being in the church, in the family of God, a living stone placed there in God's building. So let's look this morning and review God's purposes for our life and how the church helps us fulfill them. Here's number one. The church centers your life in God through worship. If someone was to say to me, what is worship? I'd say, worship is simply building your life around God. Centering your life around God. Look, God did not put you or me on earth here to live a self-centered life. 
He didn't put you here for your benefit. He put you here for his benefit. I'm going to say that again because that might have surprised one or two of you this morning. He didn't put you here for your benefit. God placed you here for his benefit. You exist, I exist for God, not vice versa. And God wants you to be the hub of your heart in terms of your relationship with him. God wants to be at the very center of your life and all you do. If you like the axis of your existence, the core of your being. God wants to be the focus of your attention and the center of your life. The Bible calls that worship. Worship's not just singing, and that's part of it, or raising our hands or dancing before God. Worship's a lifestyle. Worship maintains itself in everything we do daily in our lives, our living, our walking, our talking, our family. Anytime God is at the center of your life, you're worshiping him. So let me compare that in another way. How do you know if God is really at the center of your life? It's really simple. You're worshiping him. And as a result of worship, you live, and I watch it shows itself in a practical way. As a result of being a true worshiper and having God at the center of your life, you start to live in peace and contentment no matter what. If you like, worry, anxiety, fear, discontentment are actually the symptoms or the warning light that God's not actually at the center of your life. Somebody once said, and I'm not sure who it was, but it was a great saying, they said, you will always be in life either worshiping or worrying. Mm, good. You see, when God's not in the center of our lives, when we're not truly worshiping him, then other things start to take the place of God in the center of our lives. When our career becomes the center of your life, when the family becomes the center of your life, when money becomes the center of your life, when anything takes the center of your life except God, we're not living the way God wants us to, and therefore we get prone to the pressures, the stresses, the strains, and the other things of life that come around us. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus said it himself in Matthew 22, 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. God says the most important thing you can do in life and with your life is to know him, to love him, and to worship him. That's our highest calling. That's the first purpose of our life. God put you on earth, number one, so you could have a relationship with him that glorifies him, blesses him, and worships him. God is looking for people who want a relationship with him. God looks all around the world and he says, is there anybody out there who really wants to know me? Is there anyone there who really wants me to get close to them? And if they want to do that and they worship me rightly and bless my name, then I'll get close to them and I'll fellowship with them and I'll have a relationship with them. And that's the first purpose in our life, to know him, love him, and worship him. So what's the best way to be a worshiper? My consequence, if that's true, and I believe it is, what's the best way to be a worshiper? Do you uh, go home and light a little incense in your house and, or, or, or burn your candle? Or do you go through a certain uh, number of chants uh, uh, and things like that? Or do you have to wear certain robes or clothes to worship God? Well, what, what do we have to do to worship? Well, the Bible's very clear about how we're supposed to worship. Listen to it. The first church we're told in Acts 2 it says they worship together regularly at the temple courts. Did you catch that? They worshiped together regularly. Let me put that in good Belfast language. They always showed up together, and then they worshiped God together in one place as one family at the church. Psalm 27, 4, the thing I seek most of all is the privilege of meditating in his temple living in his presence every day of my life and delighting in his incomparable perfections and glory. That's worship, putting God at the center of our lives every day, learning to worship him every day. And that's one of the great purposes of the church. By starting your week like you've done today, by worshiping together as God's family, you're starting your week by centering your life around God. And surely that helps set you up to do that for the rest of the week. That's why we show up here this morning. God's purpose is for us to be useful in his kingdom, and we show up this morning to worship him, glorify him, bless him, because his purpose in our lives is to glorify him. Here's number two. Church helps you connect with other believers in fellowship. 
Now look, we've already noted, first of all, God wants you to connect with him. But then he wants you to do something else. He wants you to connect with other members of his family and learn to love them. Now, did you, did you notice that wee tag you put on at the end there? He wants you to fellowship with members of his family and learn to love them. Hmm. Fellowship is learning to love other people in God's family in spite of our differences, our character traits, all the stuff that goes with our human nature. That's all it is, learning to love other people in God's family. That's fellowship. Listen to what 1 Peter tells us. God has given us the privilege of being born again so that we're now members of God's very own family. Whether you like it or not, Jen, you're related to me this morning. I'm your big brother. <laughs> You're my weird sister. No, I didn't mean <laughs> Whether you like it or not, this morning, Gary, you're related to me. Like it or not, Andrew, you're related to me. We're, thank God for one that actually loves me. We're family this morning. If you're born again, you are part of my family, and I'm part of your family. The Bible says God is love, so he wants a family that he created to love one another. You want to know why you're alive and kicking this morning? God made you to be part of this family to show up and love in this family. God wants you in his family, a family that's going to exist forever. And the Bible tells us that God wants you to learn to get along with other members of the family now because you're going to have to get along with them for a long time in the future. Look, just like a parent enjoys watching his or her kids get along, play together, have a good time and a good life together, God wants his children to learn to love each other. Why? Because God himself is love, and he wants his family to be a place of love and environment that cares and nurtures people. You know, <laughs> when Jesus returns to rule and reign, there are a couple of things you're going to continue to do then when he comes to rule and reign and set up his kingdom in its finality. There's a couple of things you're going to continue to do then that we're supposed to be doing now. One of them, as already mentioned, is worshiping God. We're going to be worshiping him for eternity. But the other is loving the people who are there. Hmm? Listen to what God says. He says, on earth I want you to practice, I want you to practice learning to love me and learning to love other people because God is love. You see, unfortunately, a lot of people live very self-centered lives. They live for themselves. They live for their own comfort. They never go through life learning relational skills properly, never learning to love other people, never learning intimacy, never learning genuine fellowship, never learning how to get along with each other. And they've missed the second purpose of God's life in us, to love other people in God's family. Love God first, but then let's start loving each other with that same love of God. A note, and this is kind of... This is the kind of polite reply that I gave to that person who said they didn't need church. God didn't put you on earth to live an isolated or insulated life. He put you on earth to practice loving other people in the family of God in particular. Why? So you'll be ready to keep on loving them in heaven. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy, we are members of God's own family. This is the church of the living God. This is the support and foundation of the truth and principles on which we live our faith. We all know the importance of building a good foundation for our homes, don't we? When the storms come, they'll stand, they'll, they'll take the pressure. And if you don't have a good support and foundation, when the storm comes, your home's going to fall down, crack up, fall apart. Now, I am not a mind reader or a fortune teller. I can't predict the future unless it's what God's word says the future is going to be. I can't tell you all about your life, but I do know this. You and I need a firm foundation because the storms of life are gonna come, personal storms, health storms, financial storms, relationship storms, emotional storms that will start to rock our life. And if we don't have the right support and foundation, you're going to crack up. And somebody, for goodness sake, tell me where you're going to find love, support, and a good foundation. Where is it? In the church, in the family of Jesus Christ. We need relationships, and God has given us a place to find healthy and balanced relationships in the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Romans 12, 5 says. Come on, isn't this good stuff this morning? It says we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. 
<laughs> That's a brilliant. Everybody should have a copy of that in their back pocket. So when they walk into somewhere and somebody starts to get on their nerves in church, for example, they can pull it out and go, hold on a minute. They need me and I need them. Let's wind our neck in and start behaving like Christians. We need worship as the first purpose of life. And we need to learn to love one another as the second purpose of life. And we can do both in the family of God and the church of Jesus Christ. Tell you, I feel I'm preaching so good this morning. I could take notes from myself. <laughs> uh, number three, church helps you cultivate maturity and contribute something back for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a big word in the Bible, and it simply means grow up. It's discipleship. Discipleship. Discipleship is a process of growing up spiritually and becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. God doesn't want us to stay spiritual babies. He wants us to grow up. How? Well, by knowing his word, by trusting in his wisdom, by obeying his commandments, by developing good character. God wants us to grow up in the things of God, to mature and develop. Look, one of my kids is sitting here this morning. If she was still behaving like a toddler, I'd start to get worried. I really would. So how do you think God feels when he looks at his children who haven't grown up? Who haven't grown up? They haven't got out of the nursery yet. They're still playing in the shallows. They haven't got out into the deeper water and spiritual things of God. They're not growing spiritually. And I'm sure God's disappointed and concerned and worried about that. Look, here at House of Worship, your growth is our goal. Everything we do here is to help you grow spiritually because God wants you to grow up and develop good spiritual character. Why? Why does God want you to do that? Well, I could probably quote a number of reasons, but here's a very important one. Because as you grow up, you're called to ministry and to reproduce yourself. You're called to ministry, in other words, to continue to serve God as you develop and mature, and then ultimately reproduce yourself in another Christian and believer. Listen to Hebrews 5, 16. By now you should be teachers. Instead, you still need somebody to teach you. Hmm? God wants us to grow up. One of the marks of maturity is that you begin to pass on what God has given you through love, through ministries, through encouragement. Maturity, and it's not an end in itself. Maturity is for ministry, ministry that allows you to develop character and a nature and, and a passion for doing God's work. God wants you to grow up and be able to pass it on. Look, when I say that, I understand that only a few will ever be called to pulpit or public ministry. But in reality, all of us are called to minister in the kingdom of God in some shape or form. We're all called to teach and admonish in different ways and in different situations and in different circumstances. Some are called to teach a friend who needs some advice. Some are called to teach a brother, a sister, or a loved one who's worried and concerned and to console them. Others are there to parent the other immature children in the house of God because you're already mature and you can help them that grow up. Maybe some are called to teach in small groups. But look, what I'm saying is every one of us is called to grow up and mature so we can minister to others, pass it on to others, redevelop others, and reproduce others for the kingdom of God. Ministry is not just something that the pastor does. Ministry is something that everybody's called to do, which is one of the reasons our motto says, where everybody is a somebody, because we're all called to do something in God's house. We're all important to God's house. Ministry is something we all can do. It means using whatever gift and ability God has given you to minister to other people with the love of God. Huh. God didn't put you on this earth just to take up space. Just to use up resources. Just to party on and die. No, God didn't do that. God put you here to make a contribution with your life to the kingdom of God. You're to leave this place a better place because of you. I'll, look, did you catch that? I'll say that again. You're to leave this place, the family of God, a better place because of you. And I'm supposed to do the same thing. It's called ministry. 
Anytime you use your talents, your gifts, your abilities, your money, your time, your intelligence, your energy, your physical skill, your opportunities, anytime you use them to bless somebody else in the house of God, it's called ministry. Listen to what 1 Peter 4 says. God has given each of you some special abilities, but he doesn't stop there. He says this, be sure then to use them to help each other. Not good. The way we serve God is by serving others. So what's the next step of growth in ministry? Very simple. If you're here this morning and you're not doing something, get involved. Get involved in some shape or form. Maybe it's something as simple, and I use that word very carefully, I don't mean it, simple as helping make a cup of tea or take somebody a cup of tea who who can't get up to get it themselves. Uh, Maybe it's something as simple as that. Maybe it's something uh, of just sitting and talking to someone and encouraging them. Maybe it's a public ministry of some shape or form. Look, just find something to do in God's house and do it. That's ministry. Listen to God's word again. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your work for God is never wasted. (laughs) Know what our attitude to be to God? You show up to God's house and say, God, whatever, whatever, and let me do it. Number four, only 15 more to go. No, (laughs) final one. Church helps you communicate God's love to others in evangelism. The Greek word that the Bible uses simply means sharing the good news. That's what evangelism means. Share the good news. Pass it on to somebody else. And any time you're doing that, passing on God's good news, then you're an evangelist. What is the good news? Well, here's the good news. Here's the good news you can share with somebody else. A boy, does the world need good news like this? Here's the good news. Number one, you're not an accident. You know what's the problem with half the population of the world? They don't value themselves. They just look at themselves as some accident that eventually developed out of something that crawled under a stone and then came out again and started to develop into something else. You're not an accident. Here's the good news. God designed you to last forever. (laughs) How's that? Here's the good news. God has a purpose for your life. You're not an accident. God has something better that will last forever for you, and God has a purpose and plan for your life. And here's the good news. No matter what you've done, Jesus Christ will forgive you because he's paid for it. (laughs) Come on, doesn't it just get better and better? God has a purpose for your life. He's got a plan for you that will eventually take you into heaven itself. That's the good news, and you know what? The world needs to hear that, folks. There are only two things you can't do in heaven. One of them is sin. There'll be no more sin in heaven, (laughs) in God's kingdom. But the other thing you can't do is tell people who haven't heard the good news that they've got to hear good news. Now, of those two reasons, there's no sinning or you can't tell anybody the good news. Why do you think God has left us here on earth as long as he has? To tell the good news. To tell the good news. God doesn't leave us here to sin. Okay, we're still imperfect. We know we're going to make mistakes, and God knows that too. God has left us here for one big, big reason, and one of that big reasons is to go and tell people about what Jesus has done for me, and he's done for you, and that there is good news in a world that's nuts and crazy and dying. He wants us to pass it on. Listen to Corinthians 5. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, and he's given us the work of making peace between himself and others. What that means is God in Christ was offering peace and forgiveness to the people of this world. Now watch that. And he's given us the work of sharing this message about his peace. Wow. Wow. So what's the next step? The next step is just go and tell somebody about Jesus. It's as simple as that. 
Just every opportunity we get in a conversation tells somebody about Jesus. Do you know there are people everywhere who want to know about God? I'll say that again. There are people everywhere. Everywhere you go in every single situation and circumstance, you will probably find someone who is actually searching for God. They might not even know it. They're searching for something. In reality, they're searching for God. We were at a wedding yesterday. I, I uh, had the privilege of... Uh, officiating at my cousin's son's wedding yesterday. And uh, during the course of the wedding, uh, actually during the dessert course, which is one of my favorites, mm, uh, uh, my cousin's daughter came up with her little girl, and she's what, about seven or eight? Yeah. And uh, uh, she said to me, the, the, the daughter said to me, uh, Pastor Jim, she says, do you mind if my, my wee one asks you a wee question? She said, not at all. She says, she asked for her her birthday. She said she asked for a Bible. Now, this family don't don't go to church. She said she asked for a Bible, so we got her one. And she's starting to read it, but there's some of the things in it she just doesn't understand. They bought her a children's Bible, obviously. Do you mind if she asked you a couple of questions (laughs) about God? Uh, uh, And I said, absolutely, go ahead. Um, and she, she asked me, she, and one of the questions she asked was, she says, um, where's heaven and what's it going to be like? So I explained to her very briefly what, what we know to be true about heaven. Um, and uh, then she asked me a couple of other simple questions as well. But the point I'm making is this. There at a wedding, and out of nowhere, a little child comes up and says, I want to know more about God. If we're willing to watch for it and willing to open ourselves to receive it, there'll be opportunities that present themselves time and time and time again just to tell people about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them the good news. Tell them that God has a plan and purpose. You know what? Bring them to church. Just don't invite them. Bring them. Handcuff them to yourself or uh, do something. Uh, Bring them to church. (laughs) And let God's spirit work on them. Let me finish. Thank you for your attention and listening. Let me close with a personal question. How many of, now I want you to be honest, how many of us have suffered or do suffer from the gift of procrastination? Well, there's about five of us here almost anyway. Of course, we all suffer from procrastination at some point in time or at some moment in time. It's a universal gift. Now, look, you see what we've talked about this morning? It's nothing new. It's nothing new. It's not rocket science. It's not like you haven't heard these things shared and taught before. And yet so many people leave church every Sunday morning across this land and still nothing changes. They still procrastinate. This church at House of Worship, let me say it, needs you. Because everybody here is a somebody. Everybody is a somebody. This church needs you. This family only works if you're here. This family only works as it should if you do something in it. This family only works if you love people in it. This family only works if you encourage your church family. This church only functions the way it should because you're a somebody in this church. But can I also say, you also need this church because it's in this church you actually are made a somebody. Mm -hmm. It's in this church you are made a somebody. Out there, Jim Connolly is a nobody. A nobody. That's the reality of it, the truth about it. But in here, I'm a child of the living God. I have a plan and a purpose for my life. I have a future that's certain and solid. Fear, worry, anxiety, none of it needs to pressure me. Why? Because I am in the hands of the living God. I'm a somebody. So I want each of us today to make a fresh commitment as we leave church today. Singers, musicians, you may come. I want each of us to make a fresh commitment as we leave church today. I want us to leave no longer procrastinating, but doing something. Are you with me, church? Well, I'm going to say a little prayer. I want you to stand with me. I want you to stand with me. Come on. 
And I'm going to say it one line at a time. And if you're with me today, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I want you to speak it verbally. And let's pray this before our God this morning. Musicians can begin to play and get ready to go into our next song. I don't want you just to pray with me. I'll say it one line at a time. You can repeat it after me. Come on, let's make a change. Let's prepare ourselves for our winter session as September comes. And, and, and let's approach it with a whole new mindset and attitude. You ready? I want you to pray this with me. God, I want to center my life around you. I want to get better connected to your fellowship. I want to get better connected to your family. I want to grow in spiritual maturity. I want to make a contribution with my life. I want to communicate your love to others. I want somebody to know you because of me. Thank you for this church family where I can be loved and I can learn your purposes for me. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the encouragement it provides us. We thank you, Lord, for all the things that it shows us in life. We thank you, Lord, that in a very practical way it fits us for your service and allows us to become useful in the kingdom of God. Lord, maybe not procrastinate. Maybe leave this place today with a new mindset, a different heart attitude about our service for the living God, to put you first, to put others next, to put ourselves into a practical ministry in the kingdom of God by making ourselves a living sacrifice and a living offering for you, and to go out and to tell others simply about the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, we believe in doing so, you're going to turn things around. <laughs> you're going to turn things around, Lord. Lord, we know that our hope is in you, and if our hope is in you, that you're going to do something. Right, yeah. You're going to heal somebody. Yeah. You're going to save somebody. Right. You're going to make a way for somebody. Yeah. Lord, you're going to touch people who are broken hearted and make them whole. Lord, we believe it and we're going to sing it this morning, Lord. God, turn it around. We ask these things in Jesus' name, giving you our thanks. Amen. God bless you, church. <laughs>